So moving on, let's talk about chapter three. In chapter three, we're going to talk, discuss strategy and tactics of integrative negotiations. We're still working with negotiating uh, negotiation fundamentals. And remember, we're coming to you from the text negotiation. Um, and the uh, this is um, was published in 2019. Um, so that's the text that we're coming to you from. All right. So let's get started. So I share my monitor. So here's some over here's an overview of the integrative negotiation process. Um, context is creates a free flow of information. Uh, it's an attempt to understand the other negotiators needs and objectives. Uh, it emphasizes the things that the parties have in common and it provides a search for solutions that meet the goals and objectives of both parties. Now the process for this is identify and define the problem, surface issues and needs, generate alternative solutions and evaluate selective alternatives. That's the process. So let's talk about creating a free flow of information. Effective information exchange facilitates integrative solutions. Negotiators must be willing to reveal their true objectives and to listen to each other carefully. In contrast, a willingness to share information is not a characteristic of distributive bargaining situations. However, a Free flow of information allows both parties to know and share their alternatives. So known alternatives means negotiators are more likely to soften resistance points, improve trade-offs and increase the resource pie. It is the, the negotiators with the alternative who is responsible for expanding that pie. Now you must understand the other's needs before helping to satisfy them. Integrative agreements are facilitated when parties exchange information about issues, not necessarily about the positions. Negotiators must make a true effort to understand what the side really, the other side really wants to achieve. In contrast, negotiators in distributed bargaining either make no effort to understand the other side's needs or do so only for the own their own ends, their own purposes. The more experienced party may need to assist the less experienced party in discovering their underlying needs. So emphasizing things in common, to sustain a free flow of information, negotiators must, now guys, they must require a different uh, outlook or frame of reference. So individual goals may need to be redefined through collaborative efforts directed towards a collective goal. At times, the collective goal is clear and obvious. Other times it's not clear or, easily, or easy to keep in, in uh, sight. As we search for solutions, successful integrative negotiations depends on the search for solutions that meet the needs and objectives of both sides. Negotiators must be firm, but flex flexible. Firm about primary interests, but flexible about how needs are met. Low concern for the other's objectives may drive one or two forms of behavior. Negotiators may work to ensure what the other obtains does not take away from their own accomplishments. Negotiators may attempt to block the others from obtaining their objective due to a strong desire to win. In integrative negotiations, outcomes are measured by the degree they meet both negotiators' goal. Now, there are key steps in the integrative negotiation process. So the four major steps in the process include identifying and defining the problem, surface interests and needs, generate or generating alternative solutions to the problems and evaluating those alternatives and selecting from among them. Now the first three steps are important for creating value. The fourth step, however, involves claiming value, distributive skills. 
The <clears throat> Petro effect frontier is achieved when no agreement makes any party better off without decreasing outcomes of any other party. Creating value must happen before claiming value. You can't claim something that's not there yet. Shark Tank, <laughs> uh, uh, one of the guys on there, he tries to tell them, Mr. Wonderful, he keeps telling them, you can't claim this value you don't have not told us. What is the value? Show us the value. You don't have value like that. So creating value is more effective when collaborating and claiming value may derail the creating value process. So look at this, creating and claiming value. And look at this is the Petro effect. All right. So the first step, identify and define the problem. Defining the problem is a way that is mutually acceptable to both sides separate from efforts to generate or choose alternatives. State the problem with an eye towards practicality and comprehensiveness and a focus on solving the core problems. State the problem as a goal and identify the obstacles to obtaining this goal. Can obstacles be corrected by negotiators? Hmm. Depersonalize the problem, allowing both sides to approach the issue as a problem external to the individuals at the table. Now separate the problem definition from the search for solutions. Negotiators should develop standards by which potential solutions will be judged for how well they fit. Surface interests and needs. Key to an integrative agreement is understanding the satisfying this and satisfying each other's interests. Interests are the underlying concerns, needs, desires, or fears that motivate a negotiator to take a particular position. Pursuing positional bargaining allows only one victor at the outcome. In distributive bargaining, negotiators trade positions back and forth, attempting to achieve a settlement close to their targets. In integrative negotiation, both negotiators need to pursue the other's thinking to determine factors that may motivate that may that factors that motivate their goals now the presumption is that both parties understand the other's motivating factors they may recognize possible uh, com com compatibilities so there are types of interests interests can be intrinsic or instrumental or both Substantial interests are related to focal issues, economic and financial issues. Process interests relate to how the negotiation unfolds. One party may pursue distributive bargaining while the other may be integrative negotiations. Relationship interests are the value of ongoing relationships. Intrinsic relationship interests exist when the parties value the relationship. Instrumental relationship interests exist when the parties derive substantial benefits from the relationship. Interest in principle may be deeply held, held and served as guides, often involve intangibles. So observations on interest. Now, there is almost always more than one type of interest underlying a negotiation. Parties can have different types of interests at stake. Interests are stemmed from deeply rooted human needs or values. Interests can change like positions. Interests can change like positions. Sometimes people are not even sure about their own interests. Listen to your own inner voices. Servicing interests is not always easy to or for the best advantage. Critics to the interest approach have identified the difficulty of defining interests and taking them into consideration. Step three, generate alternative solutions. This is the creative phase of integrative negotiations. The objective is to create a variety of possible solutions to the problem. Then evaluate and select from among those options in step four. Several techniques are available, falling into two general categories. The first requires negotiators to reframe from the problem to create win-win alternatives out of what appear to be a win-lose problem. The second takes the problem as given and creates a long list of options from which the parties can choose. In integrative negotiations, 
over a complex problem, both types of techniques may be used and even intertwined. So let's look at inventing options. Uh, so we got uh, log road. This is a trade-off uh, that prioritizes issues on bundling splits one issue into parts of log rolling. Expand the pie. It adds resources in such a way that both sides win. Modify the resource pie. Modify the pie to support both sides. Find a bridge solution. Invent a new option that meets both needs. So finding a bridge options mean compromising. These solutions do not further the interests of either party. Modifying the resource pie, subordination, when the original issue is replaced by other interests. Expanding the pie, meaning cut the cost for compliance, minimize their cost for agreeing to a Pacific solution and, and log roll non-Pacific compensation. One party gets their objectives and the other is compensated. So generating alternatives to the problem as well, brainstorming. So groups work together as many solutions uh, as possible, many, as many solutions as possible, really. Spontaneous, even impractical solutions. Success depends on the amount of ideas that they generate in the brainstorming process. Rules of brainstorming, avoiding judging solutions, separate people from the problem, be exhaustive in the process and ask outsiders. Surveys, let's see, brainstorming only gathers ideas of people present. Surveys quickly gather ideas of those not present and parties mishearing other keys, a key brainstorming advantage. Electronic brainstorming, a facilitator presents the problem and anonymous ideas are gathered for all to see. The facilitator then asks additional probing questions. So let's look at step four. We looked at steps one, two, and three individually. Now let's look at step four and evaluating and selecting alternatives. When the issue is simple, this may be a single step. Otherwise, the steps are definitions and standards, alternatives, evaluation, and selection. Negotiators would need to weigh or rank order each option against clear criteria may need to return to definitions or return to standards for revisions. And finally, the parties engage in a decision-making process and come to an agreement on the best options. The selection of alternatives is the claiming value stage. Using the following guidelines to evaluate options and reach a consensus. Guidelines to evaluate and then to select an alternative. Narrow the range of solution options. Evaluate solutions on the basis of quality standards and acceptability. Agree to the criteria in advance of evaluating options. Be willing to justify personal preferences and be alert to the influence of intangibles in selection, selecting options. Take time out to cool off. Use subgroups to evaluate complex options. Explore different ways to leg roll by exploring differences in risk preferences, expectations, and time preferences. Keep discussions tentative and conditional until all aspects of the final proposal are complete. Minimize familiarity, formality, or familiar formality, and record keeping until final agreements are closed. So assessing the quality of the agreements. You always want to assess along the uh, same two dimensions as distributive agreements. Objective outcomes and subjective values assess objective outcomes against the extent to which both parties' interests and needs are, were met by the agreement. And the subjective value is more important in intergrowth, in, integrative negotiations due to the long-term relationships of the parties. So let's look at the factors facilitating successful integrative negotiations. Their uh, successful integrated negotiations occurs when the parties are predisposed to finding a mutually acceptable joint solutions. This next section reviews seven factors that facilitate successful integrated negotiations. They are the presence of common goal, faith in your own problem solving ability, a belief in the validity of the other party's position, the motivation and commitment to work together, trust, clear and accurate communication, and an understanding of the dynamics of integrative negotiations. 
So some common objectives or goals include there are three types of goals that may facilitate integrative agreements. They are a common goal is one, is one where all parties share equally. A shared goal is one with both parties, well, both parties work together, but the benefits, but that the benefits, that each benefits them differently. And then a joint goal involves individuals with different personal goals agreeing to combine them in a collective effort. Faith in your problem solving ability now. Parties who believe they can work together are more likely to do so. Expertise in the focal problem strengthens an understanding. Expertise increases in the negotiation knowledge based on their self-confidence. Direct experience increases understanding of the process. And knowledge of integrative tactics leads to increase in integrative behaviors. So what about validity, motivation, and problem solving? So integrative negotiation requires negotiators to accept both their own and the other's attitudes, interests, and desires as valid. Believing in the other's validity does not mean empathizing. For successful integrative negotiations, the parties must be motivated to collaborate rather than compete. Maximize your outcomes by assuming a healthy interest in achieving your own goals while remaining collaborative and problem solving. Ways to enhance motivation and commitment to problem solving include recognize a shared faith and discuss gains from working together. Engage in commitments to each other before negotiation begins, call pre-settlement settlements. Create an umbrella agreement as a framework for further discussions. Um, let's talk about trust, communication, and understanding. Tactics to elicit information when the others mistrust you. Share your information and encourage reciprocity. Negotiate multiple issues simultaneously and make multiple offers at the same time. A precondition for integrative negotiation is clear communication. Mutual understanding is the responsibility of both sides. Multiple channels, channels clarify the message and watch for consistency. Metaphors play a role when direct communication is difficult and create formal communication procedures if one party denotes. Finally, studies indicate that training enhances the understanding and ability to successfully, successfully pursue integrative negotiations. So why integrative negotiation is difficult? Well, integrative negotiation is collaborative. The parties define their common problem and pursue strategies to solve it. Conflict and negotiation is essential to the differences between distributive bargaining and integrative negotiations. Negotiators may not pursue integrative agreements if they fail to see integrative potential or are motivated by their own needs. Four additional factors contribute to this difficulty the history of the relationship between the parties, the belief that an issue can only be resolved distributively, and the mixed motive nature of most bargaining situation, short time perspectives. What about histories and beliefs around all of this? The more competitive and conflict laden their past relationship, the more likely the parties will be defensive with a win-lose attitude. Even with no history, expectations decree, create defensiveness. Negotiators can proceed past a negative history, but it takes effort. Conflict dynamics lead to negotiators to lead negotiators to polarize issues and see them only in win-lose terms. In addition, negotiators may be prone to several cognitive biases that may preclude them from engaging in behaviors necessary for inter integrative, inter integrative negotiations. Nature and situations and short-term perspectives. Most situations contain some elements requiring distributed bargaining processes, others requiring integrative processes. Conflict and competitiveness drive out cooperation and trust in any situation, guys. 
A fundamental challenge is that parties fail to recognize or search for integrated potential in a negotiation, primarily to satisfy their own concerns. Effective integrative negotiation requires sufficient time to process the information, to reach understanding of your own and the other party's needs, and to manage the transition from creating value to claiming value. So distributive bargaining versus integrative negotiations, many would argue for integrative negotiations, holding that distributive bargaining is outdated. A strong understanding of both is important for two reasons. Some negotiators usually use a purely distributive approach and evidence shows that integrative negotiating is effective against such bargainers. Integrative situations involve a claiming value portion and this may involve the use of distributive tactics. A sound understanding of distributive bargaining makes it more likely you will be able to identify insincere opponents. And that does it for chapter three. All right, so we are, uh, that's a lot of information. We have a lot to discuss on our coffee and conversations. And so I look forward to the way you answer the questions and I look forward to talking to you in coffee and conversations. See you later. <laughs>